So the experiment was, could we hand pick the right people so that when you watch it, you feel that warmth? And so that's an extension of community from the making to the mm -hmm. sharing. That's something that I work on quite a bit um, through Array, which is uh, a, a, a act, image activist collective that I founded about 10 years ago. And um, we've distributed 18 films by women of all kinds of people of color by hand. And the idea is just to, thanks, the idea is just to extend the notion of community um, to artists, to the advocates and craftspeople who make them, and also to audiences. And just really to invite us to hold hands around this idea of art as experience, as mm -hmm. a cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. And what about the space now in LA? Because then there's. Yeah. Yes. I'm so excited about that. Yes. Um, I used my wrinkle in time money and bought some buildings. And uh, thanks, Disney. <laughs> thanks, Disney. Someone told me, a black exe executive told me, Walt Disney's turning over in his grave. Uh, Google. Um, but, you know, it's just, it just it's, 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 you know, I think, you know, his vision for Disney is a testament to the way that, that art morphs and changes once it enters community. Yep. And um, I don't think he would have ever dreamed that there would be a black woman directing a film there, black people directing films there, uh, Black Panther coming out of Disney, which is Marvel Disney. <laughs> um, and so there's something about the sharing of, 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 of the experience and what the artist intended and what it becomes once it, it would, you know, we've had that conversation once it goes out into the world. Um, and so our idea around Array, our, our little mini campus in Los Angeles, three small buildings um, that we're restoring and trying to get on their feet, um, is to uh, elongate the experience from the making of the thing to the exhibition of the thing. You know, I always want to go into a theater space, like a cinematic space, and mm -hmm. just feel welcomed and comfortable and warm and not corporate. And not, those are my favorite places to watch films. And so we thought we'd try to create one, so we're building that. Um, it's up and running out in LA. If you're ever in LA, come visit us. Beautiful. Thank you. Community. Well, uh, you know, <coughs> even in making a one-person show, you, um, there's a community of people around me, a very specific community. And the first one is a community of, because I make uh, my work by interviewing people. So the first communities are those communities. In the case of, of uh, Notes from the Field, my latest play, which is recently on HBO, I did... Brilliant, if you uh, haven't uh, seen. Really I incredible. did uh, 250 interviews in four geographic areas. And each of the places that I went, except for Baltimore, which is my hometown, were pretty f foreign to me in many ways. An Indian reservation, Stockton, uh, when it was bankrupt and before mm -hmm. Michael Tubbs, the, the, mm -hmm. what new era now, you know, with uh, bankrupt, homicide written up and down the corridor of shame in South Carolina, uh, so named because of how bad the schools are. Charleston, of course, uh, because, you know, I was doing the work at the time uh, that the people, uh, the prayer, the people in prayer, the, 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 the parishioners in prayer were killed by Dylan Roof at Mother Emanuel, and to Columbia to see why young Shakara was thrown across the room by a police officer and her classmate who said, you know, what, is there, what you doing? Why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Went to jail. So there's a community in that way, because the people who I interview, and I, this must be the case for you too, that the people who I interview become uh, sort of um, companions in my journey, I mm -hmm. would say, and become very important. You know, the Native American judge who opened up the tribe to me, typically Native Americans in the past, in terms of my work, have for good reason not been that welcoming. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, you can't go around the hood without meeting somebody who's gonna show you around. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a lot of the reason I do the work I do is to be able to come close to strangers quickly. So mm. there is this community of strangers who then be I become have an intimate relationship with, and that goes all the way to through till when they are invited to come see the show. And some people come many times, or the, the mm -hmm. judge came all over the country wherever we performed, and we brought Native American kids down to see it and so forth. So I think there is a community, and then uh, Elizabeth was very involved in my play about uh, the Los Angeles riots. So there's all kinds of artists who are still required, you know, to do the work. And I'm very interested in creating conversation in the room while I'm uh, making these plays, because I do it all by just acting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sort of 
see what people think, and then I like them to fight, I don't like to fight, mm -hmm. and I go home and write another play. So there's a community of discourse. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, part, the community that is particularly important to me now and intriguing is the live community that comes to the theater. Yep. And so in uh, writing uh, notes from the field, um, in two venues, I stop the show in the middle and uh, with a bass player, um, and you know, we say, hey, you know, we're black, we're from the call and response. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what we do, call and response, so mm -hmm. this is all we know about why our kids are not making it through school mm -hmm. and ended up incarcerated. This is all we know, you know more, and then we sent these groups, these 500 people, which is what the size of a regional theater usually is, to go and talk about it in groups of 20 with mm -hmm. facilitators. That's a big process and very hard. And I have to say the main thing I learned from it is we keep talking about we need this conversation about race, but I don't think we realize how expensive it is to do that hmm. and how many different types of talent, talent we don't know about yet, we mm -hmm. need in order to, to do that. So, uh, and, and out of that experience of asking the audience to be an active part of this, and, um, if anything's radical about me, it is to try to disrupt passive observance. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, because uh, even as we, we are in an era now where we have uh, more possibility than ever that really extraordinary art is also going to be activist, at least mm -hmm. in my lifetime, it's going to be one of the, it is becoming one of those very rich times. What good is it if people just leave mesmerized and riveted? Yeah, but yeah. it's that the mesmerizing and the riveted is then, and then what? And then mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Are you going to change? Are you going to change somebody else? And so I've started talking about this idea of a radical hospitality, a radical welcome. And to me, you know, hospitality is, you know, is, is everybody's welcome. Doesn't matter who you are. And then there's something radical about that. I think about Sammy Nunez, who's somebody who I interviewed in uh, uh, Stockton, who has one hand because of what his youth was like. And he's really a healer and everything else. And, he, you know, he's talking about how you know, what it's like that nobody wants you there, wherever there is. Why mm. are you coming to school, he said. Why don't mm. you just go away? Mm. So to me, yes, there's ways that our arts institutions don't have enough, quote unquote, what we used to call outreach in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But it's also that there is a sort of precious stuffiness about it, even among the artists who work there, or let's not even go into who's running those institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, that I feel that the idea of a radical welcome is radical because it has to do with if the audience is animated, who has a voice? Yeah. So, yeah, and I, you know, I hope in my lifetime that I see other people trying as, trying hard to, to get at that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, a, I, I love that idea of radical hospitality and the idea that, that the artists and the institutions putting forth the art should be welcoming, but I also really think there's a responsibility of the audience. The audience has power. Yeah, the that's audience it. audience has power. Doesn't have to wait to be welcomed, can demand, because so many of these institutions truly are trying to cater to you, um, especially in my industry, in film mm -hmm. specifically, it's always trying to figure out what they want, they is you. Mm -hmm. You know, constantly the, 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 the testing and the, I've sat around some tables and heard crazy things about what people want. Well, people uh, are you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, you know, with Panther, with Wrinkle in Time, with Get Out, with a lot of these films that are out now, it's kind of like <coughs> they've finally given us, you know, the thing. And I just would love to turn the conversation to, you know, you take it, you demand it, and it happens. Mm -hmm. And these films are not... Precedential. They, they're not the first time we've had films that folk have said, this looks a certain way and we want this. Mm -hmm. And yet it always reverts back to the same yeah. old thing because mm -hmm. we don't apply that pressure and we don't demand and we allow um, full-bodied, robust images where you're seeing all kinds of people being fully human. Um, we don't keep the pedal to the metal on, on that becoming not a trend, but a fact. Mm -hmm. And for artists, for me, we're continuing, continuously trying to get to a place where 
Um, we're proving that the audience want, wants that, but it's the audience that has to demand it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it goes both ways, and ways in which artists and institutions can be more welcoming, it's huge, but also one of the things that audiences and like-minded people who believe in justice and dignity for all in our images included, what can we be doing to bridge that gap together? Because it's applying pressure from both sides, mm -hmm. I think is mm -hmm. a real key that we don't talk about enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's so interesting also kind of, and the, the flip side of what you, what you all are talking about, you've mentioned being a loner, that, that part of self as artists, and I know there's that part of you, self as artist, that has to do things by yourself, but what I'm hearing is how community comes with you, too. Um, I think about all of, of your characters who, you know, you reference them or their words are now part of your language and they come up outside of the play over the course of a lifetime and the way that you're talking about making family. Uh, when you make a, a play, I wouldn't have, a, a film, I wouldn't have started at that place, but it's a wonderful reminder of what we make to carry with us when we're doing what we need to do on our own as well. Um, I've been thinking uh, a lot here about generations and thinking about how um, one of the things that Brian Stevenson's project does is our generation is giving voice uh, and name uh, to some of the things that were violated in the generation and generations before us. And I think that also our generation being somewhere in the middle, uh, is also uh, a teaching generation to younger people. So I'm thinking a great deal about flow and transmission. And I was thinking about how our immediate forebearers, our parents and our grandparents, our beautiful parents and grandparents, prepared us to be ready for something that they could not see. They didn't know what now would look like. You know, no, no, nobody knows what the opportunity in the moment is. So this unimaginable memorial and museum, no one could have said, you know, this is what it, it should be, and yet here we are making it. So I, I wanted to ask each of you about your immediate forebearers and what are some of the ways that they prepared you for your journey? What are some of the things that you were told that you've taken with you that have been helpful or that you've pushed against? Mm. Well, I mean, I think, uh, I think about uh, their, my family, I always quote my grandfather saying, if you say a word often enough, it becomes you, yes. which is really is the sort of uh, the whole basis of, of the work that, that I've, I've uh, spent my adult, adult life doing. Um, but you know, I do think about what the pushing against is. Yes. And you know, that when I was in acting school, it really was like mm. Sam Shepard was radical, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly no black uh, people were who we were studying or the texts that we were using mm -hmm. to study acting. And I would have to go on Sunday, my only day off, to City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco down in the basement to the used, oh, somebody's from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the used bookstore and these, you know, plays uh, from the black arts movement that were very short-lived, mm -hmm. to have any sense. So I think in my generation, uh, and I remember coming to Penn when you mm -hmm. were there mm -hmm. uh, to make a play about Penn, about the professors there. And one reason that I was able to develop my work in uh, universities at that time, the theater didn't know what the heck I was doing, mm -hmm. but universities had, and I don't know why I haven't studied the history of it, started to make this um, move towards diversity of the canon. So then they found out, oh, well we have this literature, but now we have these people who look like the literature mm -hmm. and they're not getting along. Mm -hmm. And so once the body is there, then you know I, I was able to go in and do these interviews and sort of show what the communities of learning were like. But when I think that how quickly from the 70s to the 80s that the sort of who was writing mm -hmm. uh, changed pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that took a lot of pushing against, not just from people in the theater, but particularly, I think, from academics and activists, I have to say. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to filter, it, it starts to move, uh, move around. I, I, I suppose that's, that's what I would say about it. Um, you know, I didn't come from artists, really. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, maybe that's what all I would have to say. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Well, Montgomery, Alabama, I was, I was uh, coming in this morning on the red eye, got in this morning, and the man was driving me to the, to the hotel, and he said, uh, first time in Montgomery, and I had to laugh because it's like my 119th time in Montgomery. Yeah. Um, so my father, ah, <coughs> uh, the most beautiful man I've ever known. Um, who watches us from above today, smiling for so many reasons. Smiling because my mother is here. Smiling because my sister, Tara Duvernay, is the deputy program director of EJI uh, and put this thing woo! together with Ryan Stevenson. My gosh. Smiling because my sister, Gina, is an assistant professor and librarian over at Alabama State, right up the street, Gina Duvernay. Mm -hmm. Smiling because my brother, Nicholas, is running talent in the back for this thing and, and helping all of the people who are speaking get around. And my brother, Christopher May, um, is making sure everyone looks fly because he's the best barber in Montgomery and he's out in the back uh -huh. lining people up. And so we're all here and I know he's smiling on us, but this feels like home to me, this place. Um, so when I think about family and I'm here today, you know, uh, I remember scouting Selma with my father, coming out here and like, Papa, I'm coming out. Can you take a day off work? He owned a small carpet and flooring business. Yeah, yeah, I can take a day. Where are we going? I was like, we're going scouting. He's like, okay, what's that? I said, we're going <laughs> to walk around and look at places that I might shoot. He's like, we're just going to walk around. I said, we're going to get in the car. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a photographer with us. We're just going to take pictures and walk around all day. Is this work? Yes. <laughs> this is my work and we're gonna do it. And I still have those pictures. Mm. And we walked around and we went to all of the places that Dr. King and SNCC and SCLC and Amelia Boynton and everyone, everyone from, from Montgomery all the way to, uh, through Lowndes County into Selma. And I remember that day and every time I come back here, which is often, many, many times a year to see all of my family who still lives here, um, I think of the art that I've made about this place, both in Selma and in 13th, and being able to do that out of a deep sense of family. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't just a film about Dr. King or about the movement or about whatever people think that film is about. For me, it was really a, a ode to my father. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at five years old, yeah, Adam, at, at five years old, he was one of the kids waving to the marchers as they walked through Lowndes County mm. and um, has had very faint memories of it. It was a 60 Minutes piece. Uh, 60 Minutes came down and walked with me through, and he had talked about those memories and had shared with things with me that day or with the journalist that day that he'd not shared with me. And so in thinking about, about Selma and about this place and about being here and about, um, you know, just his energy, which I feel... Uh, I appreciate the question because it lets me uh, just really revel in, um, you know, that beautiful synthesis of, like, of, of creativity and family that I don't think we talk about enough. Like mm -hmm. so often when we're putting up scenes or you're writing dialogue or you're talking to an actor, um, you're tapping into things you know, like people mm -hmm. that you, I do, you, you interview all kinds of people and become different people. But for me, the characters I feel closest to, the, I'm drawing from something that I know. And when I really uh, dig into it, it's my family, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, go ahead. You know, it, as you're talking, I'm, I'm also thinking about, uh, thinking about Baldwin, and I'm sure other people too, but I love the way he said it in a conversation he had with Margaret Mead, the past is the present. And there's so much, there's, and I, uh, one of the reasons we're here today is about memorializing the past and, and that which we can't see. And when Skip Gates did my um, roots, mm -hmm. I found out about a relative that I should have known about, mm -hmm. but I think in my, my parents tended, my, not just them, but their friends, not to give us the whole story. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was a girl, we went all the time to Gettysburg uh, to visit my great aunt Hannah Biggs. My brother's name is Albert Maurice Biggs Smith. Mm. My favorite uncle, who your father reminds me of, is mm -hmm. Uncle Biggs, mm -hmm. Fraser Smith. And uh, the Biggses 
were my father's maternal uh, side. And what Skip, you know, <laughs> showed me about my past <laughs> as he was sitting in my, you know, living room, you know, turning that book, uh -huh. like, are you ready to turn the page? <laughs> and uh, is that <coughs> Basil Biggs, and I had a great uncle, Basil Biggs, who we mm -hmm. would go see, and we were very interested because he taught gym and he ate Wheaties and stuff. <laughs> that, that my great, great uncle, Basil Biggs, was a veterinarian who uh, was a part of the Underground Railroad, and he hired the men who buried the dead in mm -hmm. the battlefield at Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is this way that the past, and this is why history is so important, and, and projects that take us to the past are so important. I have to say, unearthing that, about the Biggses, who had been all around me. We played in the battlefield mm -hmm. when we went to see Aunt Hannah. Nobody told us what her father had done, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable to me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I have to say, I felt a different claim on America mm -hmm. than I'd ever had before. And, you know, people will say things to me like, well, you should just write about what you know. In my case, race riots. But the, the, the America that we all are of, and in the ground, I'm thinking about, you know, my great, great uncle Basil Biggs, mm -hmm. putting the dead in the ground of the mm -hmm. battlefield of Gettysburg, that we are so much a part of this soil and this, this earth. Yes. Um, and um, I just want to make a shout out for teaching better history in the schools. Yes. 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 Because, by the way, this uh, stuff about uh, Basil Biggs did not come from me spitting on a stick. It was all documents and deeds and paper, mm -hmm. right, that, that exists. And, you know, I, I didn't even know about it. It was my own family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think also what you're describing is um, helping us understand how, you know, slavery, and I think that, again, to take it to this space, part of the argument of this space, slavery did not end, it only evolved, is uh, to show us that that's, the time frame is really not all that big. Right. I mean, you know, my, my mother, who is a historian, would, and who is, you know, uh, with us, and would go into her classes and say to her students, when she was teaching them African American history, you know, my four grandparents were born into slavery. I knew two of them. <laughs> it's not that far, you know, my, my, my living mother, you know, grew up with her, and we can all tell these stories, but my point is that once we know these stories and also take our responsibility for how we kind of interpolate them into the present, you realize that all of the things that, that America hasn't yet dealt with are not that far back. Um, I think also, I mean, again, just, you know, just to this, how we were taught from our people who were in different circumstances but gave us such great tools. I hear keep thinking about, I hear the words of my beloved grandmother who was born in Selma, we've talked about her, and of her many pieces of wisdom that when I heard them, I didn't know what I'd have to do with them. But I remember she used to say, if I would tell her this racist thing happened or that racist thing happened, she'd say, what does that have to do with you? If you're called a dog, do you answer? <laughs> you know, like that's not your name. So, so, you know, she was so dismissive. She said, leave it, leave it over there as someone else's problem. And then she would say, because those people are so very, very limited, we pity them. I mean, so like that kind of sort of pithy, like, all right, well, what do you do with that then when, you've had, when your feelings are hurt, right? You, you, can, you can do something with that. Or I think about my dad telling me, you know, always speak up, someone is always listening. You might not always know they're listening but we need each other's voices. Always use your voice. So, you know, I don't know, I, I feel being here has me thinking so much about what we've been given and how we will now use it. And I think that's really kind of exciting and amazing to think about. Um, and so to this place, to this occasion, to why you're here, to why we're here, um, if you could both just reflect uh, upon uh, this occasion, this mission, and this space. Why, why, are, why are we here? Ava, why don't you start? Okay. Um, I know, well, something that you were, you were saying reminded me of this um, 
uh, beautiful Toni Morrison, um, I guess like six years ago, uh, a university in Oregon had uncovered some material of a, a visit that she made there like in 1963. And I was listening to the tape as black girl uh, nerds do uh, when you hear about such a thing mm -hmm. and um, was reveling in it and, and uh, decided to kind of transcribe this piece that we put up on our, our array site. And I always keep, keep in the back of my mind in times like, and, and it's not dissimilar to what your grandmother uh, would tell you, which is that, you know, racism is a distraction to keep mm. you from doing your work. And um, that, that it is, that it is, you know, literally a construction to divert your, your attention from your own yes. life and humanity. And that um, it has you constantly explaining yourself and um, trying to prove the worthiness of your own existence. And uh, I think about that in this context, because when I walk around, walk through the memorial on the Legacy Museum, it doesn't feel like an explaining of um, what has happened for other people is very intimate. It feels very, it feels very drenched in blackness to me mm -hmm. in a very beautiful way, mm -hmm. in a way that is informative to people who aren't but also deeply intimate and emotional to people who are. And I know that we've all been to various museums and exhibits and installations, and sometimes there is a, um, a sense to me that some things are constructed for people to, uh, cons cons they, they, they may not have as much of an interiority as I feel here. Mm -hmm. This feels very inside to me, mm -hmm. and yet, open for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as I've, as I've been kind of, I had a chance to have a preview of it last month. It just felt very uh, handmade, mm. very much like the cruise, like the, the, the curators of this, like just selected every piece, like Ralph Angel's hairline, you know what I mean? Just like <laughs> everything was put together in a way um, where it has a beauty and it's proclaiming something as opposed to trying to justify existence. And, I just think that um, as I think about this place, I just you know embrace the necessity of that, uh, and, and really feel like it's important to de to define and kind of discern that there's something different going on here in the very kind of point of view that it's asserting as you walk through these spaces. So uh, I think it's incredibly exciting. I think it's nourishing. It's necessary. I hope you know, and I've thought about this a lot, talking with Tara and Brian about it that. Um, my sister about, you know, how, how, do, how do we get people to come here and make the pilgrimage here? It ain't easy to get yes. here. You gotta take yeah. two planes. Ain't no direct flights out of here yeah. to any mm -hmm. place on either coast. Y'all know, mm -hmm. y'all was in the Montgomery airport. Mm -hmm. um, and, but we must, we must, yep. we must. You know, you, there's, there's no one, that, we must, and we must, this group, you know, this first group really have to be evangelists yes. to go out and say what you saw here and what you experienced here. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, these people, if I could just take a side thing, like, these people are lawyers fighting for people on death row. Like, there is not another staff of people just doing this. It is Brian Stevenson, truly. It is. It is. Yeah. It is just so people know, I'm going to give you the inside, inside, you know what I mean? There's not like a sexy new group of people that are doing the memorial in the museum. It is those lawyers and those people, like, my, like those program managers, that like the, the people, the, 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 the men and women who they've been able to kind of free and exonerate from death row, who they themselves, they drive them to their doctor's appointments. They, they, these are the same people. I, I sound so Hollywood right now. Doing law, whatever law is, like doing <laughs> law. It's the same people who are also in meetings about what goes in the museum and what, you know, and what's happening yes. at the memorial. Like it is a small family 
of passionate people who are trying to apply every ounce of grace and gusto and gumption that they have to offer this. So they're not also thinking about how to like market it to the wider world. Mm -hmm. So eventually that will come and that's, it's mm -hmm. been a beautiful kind of um, campaign that's happening, but I think the real campaign has to go beyond this first you know, week of pop of the New York Times pieces and all that. It's like, mm -hmm. this has to be a place where every American that believes in justice and dignity yeah. must come here and you must bring your children here. You have to, yeah. you have to. And we are the first ones to experience it. And so what, what will we do in the same way that you said, same way you said, don't just leave feeling like that was amazing. Or I cry. I, I cry. I cry. I was so. It's I just. Cried. It's too much. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to say Do that. Do something. That what, what, the way you just said that gave me animated for me even more this idea I've been carrying around for the last three years of a radical welcome and a radical mm -hmm. hospitality. It isn't just you are welcome. It means come in, take a hammer, do something. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. stop the passive observance and. Uh, uh, yeah, you know I haven't I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I just just came in and 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 uh, I, I will obviously, but just from uh, listening to Brian mm -hmm. uh, in the lead up and how beautifully he tells that story uh, that is in his book mm -hmm. about the boy that he was making fun of and his mother beckoned him over and yes. said, "You go over there, you know," yep. and you. You hug that boy. <laughs> he walks over. Says, "Come back. You go over there and you tell that boy, I love you." Mm -hmm. He goes over and says, "Oh man, you know, I love you." <laughs> and then the boy said to him, "I love you too." Mm. And every time Brian tells that story, you, <laughs> oh, mm. it, it, you feel the love in him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that uh, we sometimes don't understand how much love there is in activism. Ooh. And uh, uh, yep. radical love, uh, a word you've used, you know, radical humanity. Mm -hmm. And um, from what I can tell so far, I think this is a healing space. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a healing space, which is again, you know, like those, active healers, mm -hmm. so you are the first responders. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, I think that, that, that love in the vision, love in its deepest and fullest sense of the word, um, you know, love that harkens to Dr. King's idea of beloved community, which just doesn't mean, you know, I love you, I love you, I love you, but something much more demanding, something much more um, connected, uh, something much more animating. Because, you know, I think also of, of, of June Jordan, whose work has been so guiding for so many of us. And, you know... Poem uh, about my rights. Uh, the poem about my rights and the, the quintessential poet activist, I think. And she said, always ask the question, where is the love? What are you fighting against? But much more important, what are you fighting for? What are you trying to create? What is your vision of community? And, um, and I think about, uh, about, uh, about Brian, you know, Brian the abolitionist, right? And about, you know, Brian our Frederick Douglass in this regard, I, I thought about this just yesterday, and it's about the power of storytelling, which is why I wanna talk about, about that with you all, that, you know, he, 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 here are individuals, he is their lawyer, he goes, he meets with them, he does the things that, that all of the amazing lawyers on the staff do, that devotion, that dedication. We know his language because he's given us language that we can use for the rest of our lives. He gets proximate, right? Which is something that we've been talking about as well. So it starts one by one. But then what I think is so interesting, like Frederick Douglass, you know, Frederick Douglass went around orating, trying to end slavery, and after a while people said, Frederick, this is amazing, but you know, if you wrote a book, we could print it, and it could go to more people. We could spread you out more than just what you can do in person. So this idea of putting the stories into a book, but understanding that you need stories, and then spatializing 
in the way that this museum has. I think is, a, is amazing, but also I think it's a powerful testament to understanding that storytelling can take lots of different forms and move in lots in different, of different ways, but it's an organizing principle for what moves people. Well, and makes narrative. people empathize. That there's the narrative. narrative. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, storytelling is for all of us in some way, it's our stock in trade, right? It's the thing we do, but in, diff in very different ways. So could you talk some about just the, 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 the tool of storytelling and just take storytelling even further? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'll say a few things and maybe we can build on it. Um, everybody, I think, ev I feel that everybody is a book. Uh, I don't think it takes very long mm -hmm. before a human being has something to report, uh, that something has happened to them, uh, or they have witnessed something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it takes very long mm -hmm. before that happens. And, you know, I think the most original storytelling often happens around catastrophe. See, that's so interesting. You know, yeah. because, and Bert Tolbrecht wrote an essay called Street Scene, which is, you know, just that if somebody's out in the street and they see an accident, how they tell you about the accident is very, very animated, you know? Yes. And, and think of all the things we hear. I suppose a story is something that is making sense, that the person who's in the story, telling the story, the best stories are stories where the person's still trying to make sense, or the songs that we know, ah. that some of the songs we're going to hear tonight are songs that these great singers we're gonna hear tonight have sung many times before. Yes. But we're going to be just as engaged mm -hmm. because as they sing, they're working on something. Mm -hmm. I mean, just for example, help me with this. It's just top of my head. Yesterday, somebody said to me, uh, I just saw the most disturbing thing. And I thought, well, I wonder what it was. And it was that she went into Brooklyn to this high class, uh, like, um, uh, something closets, people from Brooklyn would notice, like a, a fancy thrift store. <laughs> and I thought, Beacon, huh? <laughs> yeah, Beacon, she went into Beacon's <laughs> closet. This happened. This just happened the day before yesterday. She went mm -hmm. into Beacon's closet and she said, so disturbing caught my attention. And then I was more interested and she said, this very, very beautiful woman walked in and just said her passion about it and the woman is in the beauty industry who said this beautiful woman with this little girl, just beautiful, maybe about 25 years old and a little baby boy. And she left the boy in a shopping bag in the corner. Oh my goodness. And the girl. Whoa. You're engaged. <laughs> I'm engaged. Right? That's the story. So <laughs> and, and she, she had to, she didn't want to leave you know, but she had to go to work, and she waited, the, the father came, and then the cops, and she still didn't know what had happened. Ooh. So she went back before going to work to c try to go and find out from the people who worked there what had happened, and it wasn't, the store wasn't open yet, right? So she went back, you know, later that day, when it opened, to find out what happened. So, I mean, I'm just putting this, that is a story that grabs you, that grabs your attention, right? There are all these elements. And so I think that a good story is a story. What happened? <laughs> we don't know. She didn't know. She didn't Where's know. Where's the baby? Where's the baby? <laughs> oh, they took the baby to the hospital. Somebody call Beacon's okay. closet. Beacon's place now. right oh, now. Dear. See, Google it and see if it's in the, <laughs> but, you know, just, Right, uh -huh. okay, so you all are storytellers too. Help uh -huh. me with why uh -huh. that's such an amazing story, right? Well, yeah. Children, it's impossible. Oh, and then Dickie came in uh -huh. and he went, um, well, because the, the, what the woman said, um, well, you know, the father came. <laughs> Dickie, you know, Dick, Dickie know said, Dick. she probably called him up and said, I left your children. <laughs> 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 The store, come get them. <laughs> so then you have oh, participation no. from people who know better right. about these communities right. and these things uh, that happen. Right. Anyway, uh, uh, she's uh, the best storyteller. Uh, it's fantastic. But it's a story. That, that's it's a, story. a story. That's a story. Uh, but I'm reminded as you're telling that story about how how the story is the perspective of the t the story being told is coloring my experience. 
you know, and um, the stories yes. that, uh, you know, many people of color and women of all kinds find themselves in are a story that we are not telling. And so I'm, I'm working on a story like that right now where all the information about the story is not told from the people that I'm telling the story about from their point of view. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm working on the story of the Central Park Five. And um, one of my guys is right there. Stand up, Yusef Salam, one of the five here tonight. Turn around, let him see you. An innocent man, an innocent man and a free man. An innocent man. Yes. A brother's gone through a lot. Come out shining. Yeah. He's gone through, gone through a lot and come out shining. And everything that I'm looking at about this case from 1989, the wolf, wolf pack, the gang of black and Puerto Rican boys who entered the park, wilding, animals, feral, all of the stories about it. They, they have no voice. Yep. 89, 1990, 91. Now it's in, it goes to trial. I poured through every trial transcript. I, I've read everything about this case. They have no voice. Even the voice that they had was not their voice with those coerced false confessions. They have no voice. They're silent. They're absent. They're invisible in their own story. And how challenging it's been trying to turn it. Yeah. Trying to, to, to literally turn it around when every single line, every single thing written and every voice, even their own, is not even their own. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, I think this is when we're just talking about story, the hardest story I've ever worked on, because it is, um, it's flipped inside out. And every day I just feel like I'm trying, I'm wrestling with the story, trying mm -hmm. to to turn it around um, and to let it truly be their experience and their voice. And it just makes me think about um, that woman's version of the story. Yep. Right? Right. You're, and, you're, then, and then the man who and walked And then in. the man's version of the story. Mm -hmm. And as, as, as... Point of view. You're talking about point of view. As point of view. Point of view. And, um, and in this place, this kind of leaderless era that we're in, um, well, and the story, and the and the stories, and the stories that we are told, and what we decide to believe and consume and to take on as fact or as fake. Mm -hmm. That really, when it comes to story, that it is not just entertainment, it is not just art. It is so often our very existence, our very humanity, is reflected in these stories, and that they have to be challenged at every turn. Well, I think it's actually a very dynamic time in that regard is because every day we're not sure who owns the story mm -hmm. and that you know it was Johnny Cochran uh, who told me that um, there's three sides to every story yours mine and the truth mm -hmm. and so we are in this push and pull time very dynamically that no, mm -hmm. nobody really owns the story but I think Elizabeth you would know you know we've been building to this mm -hmm. since the 80s don't you think to this to the, this time where we can all understand that there is no author, there is no one author. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, that that is where it, interdisciplinary studies has taken us. That's one of the, you know, and I think that it's also worth a shout out to the discipline of African American studies. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that 50 years of African American studies has brought us to a lot of places, but among other things, it's brought us to a place in part where this museum could be built. It's brought us to a place where, the, you know, when, 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 when your story was happening and so many of us were listening and caring so much, I, I never would have dreamed or imagined that the outcome that we have now is the outcome that we could have and that an Ava would be helping that story be told. So I think that, you know, I, I really do give um, African-American studies, student movements, and all that that has moved forward in the culture, and all the things that people have learned that's fanned out in the culture, not only just about us, but about 
who you see in the room is not always who needs to be in the room. Well, you know, and how do you listen to silences when other people are talking loud? That's one of the actual really, really important critical tools that African American studies has given us. Well, yeah, and that goes back to what I was talking about when I was, you know, in school in San Francisco and, you know, African American studies hadn't yet taken off yes. to the extent that it, that it did. Yes. But, you know, you, you said something very, very important, which seems like an obvious word, but it is a really important word, and that is, could not have imagined, mm -hmm. imagination. And when I went mm -hmm. in today, when I first got here, I had to go right away to rehearsal in the big room mm -hmm. for the opening ceremony tonight. And again, I was thinking about Brian, and I thought, wow, what a vision. What a vision. What, what a vision. vision. And it does take vision yes. to make anything possible. Yes, it really, really does. And, uh, you know, I think that, 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 that to think some more about this moment, um, uh, because I actually do think, I, I wonder if you all agree with me, but I think, um, okay, I'll say another thing. This morning, Michelle Alexander, many of you were there, said a very amazing thing. She said, Trump is the resistance. Wow. Okay, Trump is the resistance, and we, that is the big we, the we beyond this room, we are what's real, we are what's happening, we are this, uh, you know, bir birthing of a new stage of what the United States of America is. It's great. It, it's great, and it's so true, and one of the things that I keep thinking and have been thinking, you know, through the last year or whatever it has been, is that, yeah, you know, that shit is true, but this shit is true too, right? <laughs> so, in other words, it, 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 I, I want to think about all of the simultaneity of this moment that, y you know, there is, you know, a, a racist and hateful uh, administration, uh, you know, uh, craven, uh, ill-prepared for anything other than ignorance and destruction. I mean, I could carry on. Um, but at the same time, but at the same time, look at what's happening in the culture. Look at what's happening in the culture and look at, at, you know, all of the art and the voices and the stories by people of color that is now centered. Again, I couldn't have imagined. When I started out as a poet, I couldn't have imagined Kendrick Lamar getting a Pulitzer Prize. Okay? All right? When I started out as a poet, you know, you know, so, uh, a, a little while ago, <laughs> um, I couldn't have imagined, you know, all of the, let's just look at prizes as, as only one thing to look at, but I mean, all of the amazing, the poets, the women of color, the poets whose work is now being acknowledged in every way. What about, what about women in leadership? We got Sherilyn Eiffel sitting right here. We Did got you? Sherilyn Eiffel sitting right here. But you know we have we have we have all of this and and it is at the center of the culture. This memorial is the fine. You know I I make it my business to go look at these memorials all around the world. This is the best one in the whole wide world. Okay, in the whole wide world. I mean, you know, Brian acknowledges, and, and you know, I've been to the one in South Africa, and I was talking with a, a colleague who I visited that one with, and and it's important. But I said. Multiply it, you know, just to kind of multiply your feelings by about 76 <laughs> for whatever you felt in South Africa and what you can feel here. Multiply the quality and the execution and the vision and the complexity and the forward looking technology and the way that art is used. It's a whole nother thing, it's precedent setting. So if we want to agree that this is a tremendous not just a black cultural renaissance, but that finally, the fact that black culture is at the center of American culture and it shines the brightest, right? If that's where we are, here I think is the tough question and the interesting question for you all, is as amazing leaders uh, 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 um, of American artists, if the space, if we dominate the space, how do we lead in the space in ways that are just and expansive? How do we lead in ways that are not exclusionary when we have a leadership platform? Well, I mean, sitting to my uh, left here is a woman who started by talking about the crew, you know? Yes. Started by talking about the crew and uh, started by enumerating uh, family, her real family, and thinking about crew as family and the, and the creative environment as family. So, you know, 
It, 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 is it also a, uh, you, are you talking, you're not talking particularly about women? I think it's, I'm just gonna go back to that word welcome again. Mm -hmm. It's how many people do you invite? You know, you have a space now in Los Angeles that you're talking about. Do we see the benefit of inviting? Do we feel that more is more? And are we gonna be different in terms of who we invite? Or are we gonna be, you know, Audre Lorde? You cannot take down the master's house with the master's stools. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna be just like them? Mm -hmm. Are we gonna be just as exclusive as they were? Mm -hmm. In a way, it's harder for us to be that way because yeah. we do have to rely. It's not like you can just have all black women making, maybe you could, but, but no. <laughs> it's not as easy for you to do that as, you know, <coughs> a, a white male to have all white men making a movie. That I mean you could. Uh, making a movie, making a movie, no. Um, because it, yeah, it's um, that's a that's a complicated thing. Running array, yes. I had to really interrogate that because I'm constantly talking about walking into rooms in Hollywood that are all white men, and you know I'm the only woman. I'm the only person of color, and you know for years I've been talking about that, and yet I went back to my company array that is 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 focused on images by people of color and women of all kinds, and the company was, our, the, the team was exclusively black women. And uh, I was organizing with another group that I, that I do work with, and we were talking about, you know, pulling, we need to pull some more women in there to sign this thing that's gonna be happening next week, you guys are here about it. And, um, and this action that we're planning. So we're on the mm -hmm. phone and we're talking about, you know, bring, bringing other women in. And every woman we named was a black woman. And it really, I was driving home from that meeting and I thought, I see how this thing happens with white men. <laughs> really, when I really, really look at it, you know, in a, from a very sober place of, of organizing and finding myself in these spaces that are not declared to be black women only spaces. Those, there are spaces like that and those are sacred spaces and those, these are spaces that are, are, are supposed to be open spaces and yet we um, call the people that we know and feel comfortable with right. and safe with. Yeah. And it was really something that um, I've, I started to think about, I don't know, as little as a couple of months ago and really being able to understand how easy it is not to reach out to the person that doesn't look just like you. And so when we talk about being in a leadership position in the culture, which is a debate mm -hmm. uh, that we don't have time for, mm -hmm. um, but when we talk about in any place where people who believe in justice and dignity for whatever color or whatever kind of person you are, how easy it is to fall into the same patterns of what has been done before in terms of just the people you know. Mm -hmm. and to your question, how to break out of that, I don't have an answer to. Mm -hmm. in, in a very you know, tactical, strategic, executable, actionable way that mm -hmm. it actually is going to become a place where everyone belongs, not just invited, not just invited in the room, walks in and feel like you belong there, yes. feel like you are welcome there. You are supposed to be at school. You are supposed to be in this museum. You are supposed to be in this meeting. There's a lot to unpack there that I know I, I'm not at yet. Mm -hmm. I know I feel much, comf much more comfortable in a room with people that, that, that are just like me. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's work to be done there, but I think even asking that question has a muscularity to it, um, has an intention to it, that's a really good place to be right now as we sit at the feet of this gorgeous space, mm -hmm. invites us to say, really what Brian's done with this is, this is for all and all are included and welcomed and we know and acknowledge that that's gonna take work, mm -hmm. right? It's gonna take work to make that true and not just words. Mm -hmm. And I'm ready to do the work. I hope, I hope, I hope y'all are ready to do the work. Mm -hmm. We need to help this place grow and blossom. And some of those ideas are really a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something about it? No, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have to say that I, 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 I think about Audre Lorde. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I wonder if we have things to learn. I wonder about the people who sat around the table as you became president of the Mellon Foundation. You know, uh, who were your champions? Who were not? Mm -hmm. who couldn't imagine you in that role. And mm -hmm. it could be that these strategies, we have to seek 
a knowledge about the strategies from all kinds of places, mm -hmm. if that's really our goal. Doesn't have to be, but you know, and belongingness is a, is a big a big idea. It mm -hmm. isn't just a gesture, because that means evoking something from the inside of a person that they really belong, feel rested and safe, mm -hmm. and ready to be creative and productive. Mm -hmm. Well, we have um, just one more short um, question that uh, I want to ask you both, um, thinking again about, um, about this memorial and where we are, about how both of you, I think, in your work are very interested in redemption, in, in the question of redemption, um, and really the question of redemption. Um, so, Anna, your plays articulate that very explicitly, and I'm, I'm thinking about the John Lewis uh, voice, you know, uh, in, in your play. And I'm thinking also, especially so, in so much of your work, but thinking about how that question is so live in Queen Sugar. Um, and thinking about how people are, are trying to redeem themselves against the backdrop of what does it mean to be on that land and surface the history uh, of that land and the people who lived on that land um, in such an extraordinary way. And, and here, as I think about redemption, in the face of seemingly unredeemable acts, right? I mean, you know, at this lynching memorial, we're hearing about acts that are seemingly unredeemable. So wh where does that leave you with regard to, to, to the larger value of redemption? How do you think about that? This is what happens when you're friends with Elizabeth Alexander. This is the... <laughs> dinner table conversation, and you're just like, I am, huh? And then I say, Elizabeth, tell me the answer. You um, have the answer. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I have to tell you the place that I am right now is I'm, I'm, I'm upset reading what I read. In, when I go to Legacy Museum yep. and when I am reading, I, 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 I'm emotional. Yep. And I don't, I don't know the answer. I don't feel yep. uh, redemptive. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I don't feel, you know, I, I, I was looking at a, a, one of these, the plaques, the, the pieces in the museum, and it said, you know, 16-year-old boy burned alive in a, in, a, in a rowdy crowd in 1906 in the public square and then dragged through. The, I mean, it just, it goes on and on, and the images are so are so startling and striking and intimate and horrifying and um, you know I can make up an answer but I think you know this place has kind of scratched that the scab mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's really open for me right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I welcome that because it allows yep. me to kind of you know it's an open wound and yep. so openness is good but I I, I, I don't I, 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 haven't, I didn't walk out of walk away from the memorial thinking about redemption Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and maybe other people did. Um, it's going to be, you walk into it based on where you are that mm -hmm. day or in your life, or I may go next year and it'll be a different thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea that we can engage with it and kind of startle ourselves and shake ourselves out of a complacency about these things, or an idea that we know what it is or where we stand on it. Like, I think I walked into it thinking I was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. I really did. Like, this is going to be a certain thing. And you know, I mean, I'm I'm a student of history. Like, yep. I'm clear. I know what it's gonna be. It's it's deep. Yep. And so this yep. is a constant turning over, a constant kind of tilling of that soil. It never quite. It, it hasn't gotten you know quite healthy for me at mm -hmm. any point. No matter how many films I do, or how much study I do, or how many books I read about it, I, I can read one thing. It just it just comes and triggers me. Yeah. And so. Um, I don't, I don't have an answer to the redemption question, but no, that's a, that's uh, I'm going to keep answer. coming back until I get there. How about that? Yeah, and yeah. that's an answer. And I mean, I think that also what you're describing is we haven't had the time and space to be able to, space. to, sit, yeah. to sit with yeah, this. Sure. Yeah. Do you, I, well, I haven't been, had the opportunity yet to witness it, but, you know, when you say John Lewis, uh, and I, I, I think of his words, I can only guess that he's been through enough when he said to me, uh, you know, we're all, we've all, he quotes uh, a line in Amazing Grace, mm -hmm. saved a wretch like me. Mm -hmm. You know, he says it means that we're all falling short. We're all just trying to make it. 
And then he quotes King. The King said, we're out to redeem America. We first have to redeem ourselves. And so I do think, from what you're saying and, and what you're saying, and people said to me in the airport as I arrived, that uh, what I can expect is an experience that is uh, looking at things, but that's going to also be very internal. And uh, I'm looking forward to that, I really am, to see what it is, what the, what's the mix. And I'm so glad that, 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 you, that you mentioned what does it mean to redeem America, because I think that that is, is... Well, is that the work here, maybe? Yeah, I think that that's one of the pieces of the work. What I want to thank you both for is for being um, uh, beautiful, beautiful artists who show us what it is to be free black women. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I also just, one second, and I just also want to thank you for engaging so fully in uh, a conversation with the density and beauty and power of all that you are. So thank you and thank, thank you. for a wonderful the conversation. Density. Thanks, thank folks. You. Mm -hmm. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.